who obtained his uh, PhD in 2007 from the University of Pavia, Italy. So both the speakers today evening, uh, they are from Italy basically. And uh, before joining Oxford as visiting professor, uh, he was associate professor at the University of Hong Kong and at uh, Tsinghua University, Beijing, where he held a fellowship of the Young Thousand Talents Program of China. Earlier, uh, he has been a postdoctoral fellow at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics. In um, 2010, he has been awarded the Herman Weil Prize for Applications of Group Theory in Quantum Estimation. Currently, he is a member of the Standing Committee of the International Colloquium on Group Theoretical Methods in Physics, visiting fellow of Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics, member of the Canadian Institute of Advanced Research, editorial board member of Journal of Physics A, member of Foundational Questions Institute, and fellow of the National Vigilance Academy of Sciences, Letters and Arts of Mantua, Italy. So he's still connected with Italy. That's great. Um, so here is Professor Giulio Ciribella going to talk on programming unitary gates. Thank you, Professor Singh, for the very detailed introduction and for, and for the organizers for the invitation. Um, all right, so let me go full screen. Um, good. Uh, can you see the slides well? If you full screen. Uh, we can see, yeah, we can hear you. We can... Thank you. Um, so yes, uh, the title of this talk is about programming unitary gates. And this is a work done in collaboration with my colleague Yishan Yang from the University of Hong Kong, uh, also from QICI, Quantum Information and Computation Initiative, and with Renato Renner from ETH in Zurich. Um, all the details of the results that I will present in this talk uh, are contained in this work um, published uh, two years ago in Physical Review Letters. All right, so let me get started with a bit of an introduction uh, about uh, what is the problem of quantum programming, of programming gates, uh, quantum gates. So as you all know, in quantum mechanics, uh, the unitary operators describe uh, reversible evolutions. The possible dynamics of our quantum systems uh, are described by unitary operators. And when we go to quantum computing, uh, we describe in the standard model of quantum computing, we describe a computation as a sequence of unitary evolutions. So it's, uh, these are often called the unitary gates. So you can see here an image from Wikipedia. It's like a standard picture of a quantum circuit. We have these lines representing qubits, and each box represents a unitary gate. So a unitary operator that represents some evolution of the computer, of some of the qubits in the computer. Now, a universal quantum computer is a device that can be programmed to execute approximately every desired unitary gate. So every possible computation that we may want to realize should be implementable on a universal quantum computer. So now one problem is um, how do we program a unitary gate, a general unitary gate? In other words, how do you, we specify a unitary gate in a set of instructions that a quantum computer can follow? So we want to tell the computer, do and realize this particular unitary gate U. So how do we tell the computer which unitary gate do we want? So this is the, the problem of programming quantum gates. Um, now, there are two approaches to quantum programming. One is a classical approach and one is a quantum approach. The classical approach is the most common and actually the most practical, I must say, um, so what is the idea in the classical approach that will literally write a classical code that will tell the quantum computer which unitary gates uh, the quantum computer will have to implement. So the idea here is the one that um, many of you have learned in kind of basic uh, quantum computing courses. So you fix a finite set of gates. These are called the elementary gates. And these are gates that your computer can implement. They are built in 
your quantum computer, like the quantum computers that we find nowadays from IBM, can, imp can implement a set of elementary gates, of unitary gates. Now, after you have your set of unitary gates, you will decompose the gate you want into the unitary gates. So you will try to compile the unitary gate U into a sequence of elementary gates that your computer can realize as, as routines in the computer. So one example mathematically is the decomposition of a rotation of a SO3 rotation into rotations about the three Cartesian axis or about some Cartesian axis. So this is what many of you might have heard for the Euler angles. Here is a picture from Wikipedia of that. So you have the rotation you want to realize and you can decompose it into rotations around the the x-axis, the y-axis, and then the z-axis, or, or whatever other combination. So this is the classical approach to programming. You will tell the computer, do this elementary gate, then do that elementary gate, and so on and so forth. So you write a classical list of instructions that the computer will follow. Um, this is the most practical approach to programming, and this is the one that is used nowadays um, in most models of quantum computings and also in the impl implementation. However, that's not the only way you can program a quantum computer. There is also a quantum approach. This is kind of more fundamentally interesting. Um, the idea here is that instead of writing a set of instructions, instead of telling the computer, do this, do that, and do that, Instead, we would encode the gate into the quantum state of a control system. So we will take a control system and put it into some quantum state uh, phi u. This would be our quantum program. Instead of a classical program that is a list of instructions, we will encode the gate u into a quantum state phi u. We will use this control system. So now how do we tell the computer to do this gate u? So we will let uh, the target system, like the system, the qubits uh, on which you want to apply the unitary gate U. So we will let the target system interact with the, the control system through some fixed unitary gate W. So let's say here there is a big unitary gate W that is, is a fixed one inside the computer. So we have our target system in the state Psi that interacts with the quantum control system with the day, with the program, which is in the state phi u. And then by interacting together, if the interaction is designed well, the result on the target will be almost like applying the gate u. So the target started in the state Psi and will come out in the state u applied to Psi, almost, okay? So this is the idea of quantum programming. Instead of writing a classical set of instruction, we make our system, our target system, interact with a control system that will tell the computer which gate to implement. Now, this is more fundamental than the classical approach, and it contains the classical approach as a special case. So if you think about writing a classical program, the classical program is like a set of orthogonal states that encode some instructions. You can always imagine that you can encode a classical program into the quantum state of a system, like this phi u could be a set of orthogonal states for different values of u, for different unitaries. So the classical approach to programming is a special case of the quantum approach. So that's one reason why we are interested in the quantum approach. Other reasons is that we are interested in problems like um, uh, quantum reference frames and other cases where we use quantum systems to carry information about a unitary gate. So this problem of quantum programming has many interesting applications to quantum information theories. Although it's not very practical, but it's fundamentally important because it gives you the ultimate limit to the efficiency of programming, even if you like allow quantum states. Okay, now to make it less uh, uh, abstract, let me give you an example of quantum programming. Imagine that you want to flip a spin, a quantum spin, about an axis uh, vector n. So this is a vector in the three dimension, in the 
normal three-dimensional space, and you want to flip the spin of a quantum particle about the axis. You want to rotate it by 180 degrees uh, about the axis. Um, so how could you do that? A, an example of a quantum programming scheme is to set up a Heisenberg interaction between your target spin and the control spin. So you, you, you will encode the direction of the rotation into the spin of another particles. So you'll have the target spin, the one you want to flip, and the control spin, that is the one that will tell in which direction we will flip the target. So one way to do it is to set up a Heisenberg interaction, a spin-spin interaction between the target spin and the control spin. And you let evolve the target spin and the control spin for, for some time. Uh, initially, you would put the, the control spin in a spin coherent state. So this would be an eigenstate of the projection of the angular momentum in the direction uh, that, uh, of the rotation axis you want. So you have this nx, uh, jx of the control, and y, jy, and z, jz. So this is like uh, the angular momentum of your control spin in the direction of the axis n. So you would put uh, your control spin in the eigenstate of the angular momentum that has maximum projection in this direction n. And if you do this, this is a heuristic strategy. If you do it, you will find that you almost get the, the, the flip you wanted. You almost get the, the desired final state. The, the overlap between the, the state you wanted and the state you get, like also called the fidelity, is one minus the spin of the target to the power two divided by the spin of the control particle. See, so this up to a constant. There is a constant here, but the scaling is the, is the ratio between the square of the target spin and the spin of the control system. This was studied very rigorously in this work by Moin and myself. And earlier, it was studied in a slightly different context by Marvian and Mann in this paper in 2008. So this is an example of quantum programming. You encode the direction of a rotation into the state of a spin, and then you realize the rotation you wanted by letting your target spin interact with the control spin. All right, so this was just an example. Now let's go to the general problem. So for the general problem, the, the, the earliest result is a famous result by Nielsen and Chuang in 1997. This is sometimes called the no programming theorem. So what Nielsen and Chuang showed is that if you want to achieve programming exactly, if you want to realize a gate exactly, and you have an infinite set of gates, like all rotations or all qubit gates, um, then you would, you would need an infinite dimensional control system. So it's called no programming because you cannot uh, realize programming in a perfect way using a finite dimensional system. After all, however, this is not too bad. I mean, it's not so bad that you cannot realize every unitary gate perfectly. We are kind of used to that. The real question here is, uh, what is the relation between the precision or the accuracy of your programming scheme and the dimension of the, of the program, the dimension of the control system. So it is fine that we don't have a, an infinite dimensional control system. The question is, what, how big should be our control system if we want to achieve a certain level of accuracy? So these are the fundamental questions that many people studied since the work of Nielsen and Chuang. I mean, even Nielsen and Chuang themselves initially studied this problem after proving the no, no programming theorem in the same paper, they asked, okay, if the dimension is finite, what is the maximum accuracy we can achieve? This problem has been studied for more than 20 years by many, many authors. Some of these papers are kind of using different techniques or using different names. They not all, don't always say programming, but it's always the same, same type of problem that is there. Um, so this problem of uh, understanding the exact uh, relation between the dimension and the accuracy has remained an open problem for more than 20 years. And that's been studied by, by many people, also by many very smart people. Uh, the reason why so many people were interested in this problem is that uh, it is connected with many other questions in quantum information theory. As I mentioned before, 
quantum reference frames. There is also quantum thermodynamics. You want to kind of do quantum thermodynamics uh, using clocks uh, and have quantum clocks uh, used to time your systems. And then you, you still have this question of how big must the clock be uh, in order to tell time precisely. So this is always kind of related to the problem of programming unitary gates. Now, the point of today's talk is that I will give you the asymptotic solution of this open problem uh, that, that I mentioned. So we now know the solution, at least uh, asymptotically, when we want our error to go to zero, we know how the dimension of the control system should grow, like how big should the, the quantum program be. Uh, here is the result. Let me mention the, the result in this work. So the minimum dimension of the control system that you need if you want to program an arbitrary unitary gate in dimension D, or D target in dimension of the target system, should have this expression. So the logarithm of the dimension of the control system, so the number of qubits in the control system should grow like the logarithm of, of one over epsilon. So epsilon is the error. So you have logarithm of one over the, over the error, the, of the accuracy times the dimension of the target system minus one divided by two. So this is exactly the best possible constant, the, the one that we have here, at the leading order in the variable one over epsilon. So we want to study the asymptotics when the error goes to zero. So epsilon goes to zero, it means that one over epsilon goes to infinity. So we look at this variable and we ask what is the leading order in this variable? And the leading order is log of one over epsilon. So this is how, how the dimension of the program or the number of qubits in the program system must grow with the error and with the dimension of the target. So this is the major result in this work by Jan Renner and myself. And the talk will be giving you some, some insights on how we got to this result. Now, before I do that, let me compare with the previous results. So previous work gave upper bounds on the dimension of the control system and lower bounds also. Um, so the best upper bound before our work was in this work by Kubitsky, Palazuelos, and Perez Garcia. It was 2019 PRL, also presented at QAP. Um, so the, the, the best that was there was d square log of one over epsilon. And you see that in our work, we basically improved by a factor two. We went from d square to d square minus one divided by two log of one over epsilon. And in terms of lower bounds, uh, well, the best lower bound in terms of scaling with epsilon was this one from uh, Perez Garcia 2006 uh, PRA. This was a log of one over epsilon d minus one over two. And uh, you see again, here we improve uh, by a factor d square, uh, by, by factor d. So we go from d to d square over two. Uh, basically, this is um, what we get. And the, the, the important result is that our lower bound and our upper bound match each other almost perfectly. The only difference is that we have this minus delta in the lower bound. We have d square minus one over two minus delta, where delta is any constant that you want, is independent of epsilon, so, but it can be arbitrarily small. So basically this upper bound and lower bound close in, close each other and gi give us the exact value of the optimal scaling. Okay, so this is the result. Now let me give you a, a flavor of the techniques that we used. Uh, let me give you an idea of the methods we used to get the lower bound. Uh, the starting point was a result about the foundations of quantum mechanics. It was not a result in quantum information. Uh, it was a result about general probabilistic theories that I know some of you are interested in. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see that a very foundational result ended up giving a, uh, giving a, a practical result in quantum information theory. Um, so what is this result? It's an alternative proof of the no programming theorem. Uh, the no programming theorem was originally proven by Nielsen and Chuang, but now in this foundational work, we found an alternative way to prove it. And this alternative way was the key to obtain the result uh, that, that of, of this new work that I'm presenting. 
So the, the alternative proof was telling you this, was telling that if you have a gate U and you can program it perfectly without any error, then the state of the control system can also be used to implement perfectly many repetitions of the gate U tensor U dagger. So if you can do U, you can do U tensor U dagger as many times as you want without any error. So here is the scheme that achieves this result. You can do it with, um, if you have your original scheme with a big unitary W that realizes perfectly the unitary U on the target, then after you do this, you would take the state of the control and recycle it, use it uh, with, the, with the unitary W dagger, and this will give you the unitary U dagger. So if you take the states that come out of this and you put it again into W, you will be able to program again U. And if you do it again, it will be again U dagger and then U and then U dagger and then U for as many times as you like with zero error. If the original programming scheme worked without error, then you will be able to get U, U dagger, U, U dagger, U, U dagger for as many times as you like. You can see that this uh, is an alternative proof of the no programming theorem, because uh, if you can program perfectly two gates, U1 and U2, then this can be done for both gates. So we can distinguish perfectly the program states, uh, phi U1 and phi U2, by putting them into this uh, scheme and generating many copies of U and U dagger. So in this way, we can distinguish the program states because we, we can amplify the effect of the program because this the same program will produce infinitely many copies of U, U dagger uh, of the gate U tensor U dagger. So that's the idea. That's our alter, old alternative proof of the no programming theorem. Now, this is useful because it tells you how you can modify so the original no programming that. theorem when you want uh, a result Ooh. where there is a non zero error. Okay. Uh, yes. Zavadas. No? Sorry. Yeah, carry on. There, somebody has unmuted himself while talking. Yeah. Yes. Carry I mean, please. feel free to ask questions if you want to ask not questions. Question. I think somebody is talking welcome. and he has not unmuted himself. Yeah. All right. On. All right. All right. All right. So okay. So let me continue. Well, anyway, any, anyway, if anybody wants to stop me and ask a question, feel free to do that during the talk. So now what do we do? Uh, we take our, our uh, this, this alternative proof without error and now we put an error. So we, we epsilonize the result, we put an epsilon, we add the epsilon. How to do this? How do we add an epsilon? So we use a very famous result uh, in quantum information theory that is the continuity of the Steinspring dilation. Whenever you have two quantum evolutions, so two quantum channels, Mathematically, these are completely positive trace preserving maps. Whenever you have two channels that are close to each other, that are epsilon closed with respect to the right distance, it's called the completely bounded trace distance or diamond norm. So if two channels are closed by epsilon to each other, then for every Steinspring dilation of one channel, so for every unitary realization of one channel, you can find the unitary uh, realization of the other channel that is uh, square root of epsilon close up to some constant like two or two root two, depending on how you define these distances. So you get, uh, basically you go from epsilon to square root of epsilon. So if two channels E1 and U2 are epsilon close to each other, you can find uh, some isometries or some unitary gates that realize the two channels that are square root of epsilon close to each other. So this is what allows you to to, to, to put an epsilon into the original result. So now if one of the two channels is a unitary gate, like the unitary gate U, then you have a, a particularly nice way to, to apply the, this continuity of the Steinspring dilation. So if you can realize the gate U with error epsilon with, uh, with this programming scheme, then it means that this programming scheme will, will basically have the gate U, the unitary gate U, and produce a state of the program, this psi u, dag, uh, psi u prime, that is factorized from, from the target system. So approximately, the, there is a decoupling because between the unitary gate acting on the, on the target and the state of the control system, up to an error square root of epsilon. 
So if you multiply on both sides by, U by W dagger and U dagger, you get also this other equation. You get that the state Psi U prime can be used as a program to implement the gate U dagger with an error at the most the square root of epsilon. So you can go to square root of epsilon everywhere. Um, this result was already mentioned by Kretschmann, uh, Krebs, and Speckens in this early work. And after that, it has been used a lot in, in other works by other people. Um, the most re related to ours is probably this work by Tajima, Shirashi, and Saito uh, quite recently. I see there is a question in the chat. Let me see. Oh, okay, no, nothing special, just a compliment, thank you. Uh, okay, if there is question anyway, feel, feel free to ask. Okay, so this is the result. Uh, uh, the result that we will use, now we'll cut and paste these two equations into our old results on the continuity. We'll have this approximate recycling of the program state. So you see, this is the same picture that we had the two slides ago, but now there is an error, there is this, we are putting epsilon errors everywhere. So the result is that if a gate U can be programmed with an error epsilon, so now not without error, but with error epsilon, if we can do it with error epsilon, then the state of the control system can be used to implement M repetitions of the gate U tensor U dagger, now with an error four times M square root of epsilon. Now you see that the, there is a propagation of error. So we go from, epsilon to square root of epsilon because of the continuity of the Stein spring dilation. And now if we want to use this gate for M times, the error will grow like M. So there will be a, a kind of an accumulation of errors. But if epsilon is small enough, we still can keep this ter error term quite small and we can make some reasoning about this. So this is the approximate result. So if you can program the gate U with error epsilon, now you use the same recycling scheme that I showed be before, and you will get u, u dagger, u, u dagger for m times, now with error, m times the square root of epsilon. Now, the intuition here is that uh, the information that you have here in the program state, in the state uh, phi u, will be approximately equal or at least even more than the information that you can get from M uses of the gate U tensor U dagger. Now, if you can uh, reproduce the gate U tensor U dagger for M times, keeping this uh, error small, then the information that you have in the original states should be enough, should be at least the information that you get from these unitaries uh, later. So to make this reasoning precise, we use the whole Evo bound another very classic result in quantum information. Now here we use the Holevo bound for pure states. So that's even easier than the general Holevo bound. So what we need is, is just the fact that if you have a set of states, phi u, in a Hilbert space of dimension d, now for every possible probability distribution over these states u, we have the bound, the, 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 the logarithm of the dimension, so the number of qubits you need to represent this system of dimension D, must be larger than the von Neumann entropy of the average state. So you average the, the density matrix phi u, uh, phi u ket and phi u bra, you average it with the probability distribution over u, you get a, a mixed state rho, and the von Neumann entropy of that mixed state will be a lower bound to the dimension of the Hilbert space. Now, if you take care of all the approximation errors, if you do it carefully, the idea that you get from the Holevo bound is that the, the logarithm of the dimension of the control system should be larger than the maximum entropy of any set of states you can generate from the gate uh, U tensor U dagger po tensor power M. As long as the error here is small enough, as long as you, you choose the M and the epsilon so that the error is small enough, this will tell you that the dimension of the control system should be larger than the Holevo bound, which should be larger than the Holevo bound you get by uh, from any fixed state if you apply the gates U tensor U, U dagger to the power M. Now, long story short, I will spare you the whole calculation with the epsilons, tell you now which technique we use, and I will give you the final result. So here, the maximum entropy uh, that we can generate from the gates U tensor U dagger tensor M 
uh, can be computed using the Schurweil decomposition. This is a result in mathematics, in group theory, tells you how to decompose many copies of SUD. Uh, the decomposition has this uh, the block representation form where you have the blocks are labeled by young diagrams with M boxes and D rows. Uh, the maximum entropy was computed in this work done by me during my PhD a long time ago. And this maximum entropy is log of the dimension squared of the representation spaces associated to these young diagrams. So if you are not familiar with, them, with the group theory, don't worry. This is just uh, for those who know, I wanted to show the technique. For those who don't know, you'll see the result in the next slide. So you want to compute this uh, sum of the square of the dimensions of these representation spaces. This is something that was done by another guy during his PhD, it was done by Schur during his PhD thesis, where he found this nice combinatorial formula. He says that the sum of the square of the dimensions is just this binomial. So we took this expression and we put it into, a, put everything together. By putting everything together, we found this lower bound to the dimension of the control system. Uh, you see that if you care about the leading order in one over epsilon, the leading order is this log of one over epsilon, the constant in front of it is one minus delta, d square minus one over two, where this uh, delta is any constant larger than zero. So morally, you can go as close as you like to zero. So the constant really becomes d square minus one over two log of one over epsilon. So this is our lower bound asymptotically, and this is the low, our lower bound in general without any asymptotics. That's the, the, the lower bound in the non-asymptotic case. Okay, so how did we get the upper bound now? Uh, the upper bound came out by a concrete way to generate programs. Uh, sorry, let me see, there is a question here in the chat. Can you please forward the example of programming some unitary, maybe we can go back later to that. Uh, let's go back to this question later and I will talk yeah, more about it. Yeah. You can tackle it at the end of the talk, yeah. Yes. Um, all right. So now how did we get the, our concrete uh, scheme for programming state? Uh, the idea is this, if you have a group of unitary gates, let's call this group U, like for us, the group was uh, SUD, but in general, you can do it for every group. If you have a group of unitary gate and you have a group representation, so you can represent the unitary gate U with another unitary gate R of U. You represent, for example, R of U could be U tensor U tensor U tensor U or any other representation. So this will act on some Hilbert space. One way to get the program state for the gate U is to apply the representation R U on a fixed state phi. So you start from the state phi, you apply a unitary gate RU, and you will get a state phi U that depends on this gate U that is encoded there. So that's a particular way to do quantum programming, to generate a quantum program. A priori, there is no guarantee that this is the best way, uh, that the best way uh, to, to program a unitary gate, but still, this is a reasonable way to get started. So that's the way we generated our program by picking a unitary representation of SUD and applying to a fixed state. Now, our unitary representation basically was U tensor U tensor U tensor U for many times. Uh, next thing is like, how do you extract the gate U from the program state phi U? Like one way to do it is to measure the, the control system, to, to measure the program state phi U and to perform a conditional operation that depends on the measurement outcome. So here is the scheme. There is phi u first, you apply a measurement, you will get an outcome i, and depending on the outcome i, you will apply some unitary gate ui on the target system. We call a scheme of this type a measure and operate strategy. And again, there is no guarantee that this is the best way to, to, to extract the gate u from the program. But uh, that's a useful answer. It's a way to get started. And this is what we did. We used this answer. So now, which representation did we use to generate our programs? Uh, technically, this is the regular representation, the one that contains all the reps, and we truncated it 
we kept all the Young diagrams with a fixed number of boxes. Uh, and well, these are Young diagram for SUD targets. So the number of rows is, is at most the target. Uh, for the input state, we chose uh, some states that are uh, direct sums of maximally entangled states. So, you know, that we can decompose the Hilbert space into orthogonal blocks. And each, in each block, there is a tensor product. So we put a maximally entangled state in each block. And these states uh, were already known from my own, from my PhD thesis, basically, to be the states that are optimal for the estimation of a gate. Maybe not the optimal ones for programming, but we knew that they were optimal for the estimation of an unknown gate U. So there was an idea that these states may be a good choice. Now, if you, I now I spare you all the technical details, I tell you what is the result. We found that if we use this technique, uh, the estimation error that we get is upper bounded in this way. So the error that you get when you try to estimate the unitary gate U from uh, basically from n copies, from n copies of the unitary gate will go to zero like this. It's, this is a Heisenberg scaling. You see one over n square is a Heisenberg scaling. And we have this constant here uh, that comes out of the calculations. So this is the precision of the measurement of the estimation. And the dimension of the system that we are using is upper bounded in this way. is basically is growing like n uh, to the power d square minus one divided by dimension of the target. So this is an upper bound on the dimension of the system. And these results are already important per se because they improve over the state of the art for estimation of unitary gates. The best result before was this one by Jonas Kahn, 2007 PRA. Uh, in this paper, Jonas Kahn found that one could have this Heisenberg scaling one over n square but uh, he couldn't give an expression of the constant. So one had to do it numerically. Now we have a, a nice analytical expression of the constant in this Heisenberg scaling. Um, now, if we combine these two bounds, you express uh, the dimension as a function of the error epsilon. So we kind of invert the expression of epsilon, you plug it into this, you get this upper bound. This is a, a, a general upper bound on the logarithm of the dimension of the control system. This is upper bounded by this expression where the leading order is in one over epsilon is d square target minus one over two. So this basically concludes the proof of the main result because this asymptotic upper bound matches the asymptotic lower bound that I showed to you before. And in this way, we basically close uh, the, 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 the problem and we, we finally have the solution of the optimal programming of unitary gates. Um, okay, so yeah, I am done. Let me give you a couple of uh, ideas for discussion. I will go fast on this. Uh, and if you want to know more, I can talk about uh, more later. So the first is the, the relation between programming unitary gates and learning unitary gates, the problem of quantum learning of unitary gates. What is the problem of quantum learning for unitary gates? Uh, the problem is that you have a, an unknown unitary gate, you don't know what it is, and you, and you can query the corresponding black box. Uh, you see how well you can learn how to perform this gate U. So the idea is that uh, you enter into a laboratory, there is a black box that performs some unitary. Now you can probe this unitary by applying it so, to some input state, by doing some quantum gate, and then you apply the unknown unitary again, you do your stuff, apply the unitary again for a bunch of times, for a number of times. And in the end, what you get is a quantum state, a state phi u. After that, somebody will take out the black box from the laboratory and will ask you to implement the unitary gate by yourself. So the, that's why it's called the learning. No? First, you can try and study what this black box is doing, and then you have to learn how to do the unitary gate by yourself. So the, the first phase was the learning or storage phase. This produces a program. And then the second phase is to execute the unitary gate. So you try to emulate the action of the unitary gate on a new state. All right. Um, in this work by Bezo and others, it was shown that the best unitary gate is really to apply, the best way to learn the gate was to apply the 
the uses of the gate in parallel on an entangled state. And the best way to learn what the gate, uh, like how to implement the gate, is to estimate the gate, is to perform a, a measure and operate strategy. But if you combine this result with our result, you find that uh, gate programming and, and gate learning are equivalent operationally. This is basically the same task. Um, so this is what we we obtain. So altogether, we have there is a fundamental equivalence of three tasks: of programming gates, learning gates, and doing a gate estimation, estimating the unitary gate, or doing metrology. So metrology, programming, and learning are eventually the same task. That's what we learned from our results and from the previous works. So basically the best way to generate a quantum program is to apply the gate that you want for many times on an entangled state. And then you will and to apply some, to encode this state into a smaller system to do some compression. That's the way you generate the program. And the best way to extract the, the gate from the program is to measure, is to estimate which, uh, which gate you had and to perform a gate based on your estimate. You get the estimate you had and you perform you had. So that's all about programming. Now, what about, um, now I wanted to show another thing that is a quantum advantage in gate programming. Now, forget for a second about programming arbitrary gates. Imagine that you just want to program a phase shift. U theta, so this would be just applying a phase to a qubit. Now, what is the classical approach to tell a computer what U theta you want to perform? A classical approach is that you just discretize the unit circle, you divide the unit circle into finite intervals, and then you tell the computer in which interval is the unitary you want. So the computer will implement one of the, at random, one of the unitaries in the interval, or it will implement a fixed one. So you just encode in an orthogonal state the label of the interval of the unitary that you want. So of course, the more, in, the more, the finer is this uh, discretization, the better will be uh, your, your programming scheme. So if you use this classical technique, the error will go like pi over two dimension of the control at the leading order. So it's a linear relation between epsilon and the dimension. Now, if you use the same strategies that I showed to you before, if you use, uh, if you prepare the optimal state for phase estimation and you use that state as a, for a program, you will get this Heisenberg limit instead. You get the, the quantum error will go like um, pi square divided by two dimension square. So there is a better relation between the error and the dimension of the control system. The error will go down like this one over the dimension squared instead of one over the dimension. So that's a sort of a quantum advantage in programming. If you look in terms of number of qubits in the control system, if you take the logarithm here of this d square, you get this, um, the, well, of this d. Here, the classical scaling is log of dimension control growing like log of one over epsilon. That's what you get from this equation. And the quantum scaling as a factor two, there is a log of one over epsilon divided by two, which comes from here. So you, you cut by a half the number of qubits that you need asymptotically when you want to, the error to go to zero. Now, what about general unitary gates? You can try to do the same thing with the discretization for general unitary gates in SUD. Uh, this is more difficult to do technically. This was done by Kubitsky, Palazuelos, and Perez Garcia in this PRL paper. They found by discretizing the group SUD, they found this scaling. So the logarithm dimension of the control, the number of qubits in the control system should grow like d square log of one over epsilon. And as you know, the best quantum programming that I showed to you does better than this by a factor two again. So we cut by a half the number of qubits needed to control or to program the desired gate. Uh, this is a conjecture that, uh, that we have. Uh, we believe that in general, if you compare the classical approach to programming to the best quantum uh, programming scheme, you will always get an advantage of a factor two when you go from classical to quantum. So the quantum advantage is basically cutting the number of qubits down, down by two compared to the, class, to the classical dimension of the classical program. 
All right, that's all. So to conclude, there is a major result here that is this uh, asymptotic relation that tells you that the dimension of the control system logarithm, so the number of qubits in the control system must grow like logarithm of one over epsilon times the dimension of the target minus one over two. Now, those of you who are um, expert of group theory, we recognize that dimension of the target two uh, to the square minus one is the number of generators of the SUD group um, with dimension of the target. So this brings us to a conjecture that um, if you have a, a manifold of unitary gates that is sufficiently smooth, if you have a, a manifold of dimension F, the dimension of the number of qubits in the control system should grow like F over two logarithm of one over epsilon. This would be the leading order in, in one over epsilon. And this is an exciting problem. We don't know how to solve it yet. It's the biggest open problem remaining from our work. But all the examples I know satisfy this equation. Uh, the example of the, of the phase for a one dimensional phase, the example I showed to you at the beginning with the two spins also satisfies this equation. So we have kind of some good evidence that this equation should hold, but we don't have a general proof. And this is of course a big open question. Okay, that was all I wanted to say. So thank you for your attention. And sure. now time for some time for questions. Thank you, Professor Chiribella. Uh, we'll see the chat box and uh... Let's see yeah. how many questions are there. So I can see, uh, uh, well, where do, do the question for me start? I guess, uh, uh, okay, what the first one- What can be the was, possible values of epsilon? That's the first question. What are the possible values of epsilon? Uh, every value uh, except zero. I mean, our result, of course, if you put the zero here, this explodes. But other than that, any epsilon between uh, zero and one, or, or zero and two, actually, because this is, what is this? Not zero and one, because I think this epsilon is one minus, fide fideli one minus fidelity. So the maximum possible error you can get is one when, when, when the fidelity is a zero and the minimum error would be zero. But um, of course we don't, we cannot go to error zero because otherwise the dimension of the control system becomes infinite. This is the no programming theorem by Nielsen and Chuan. But for any finite error, uh, we have this, uh, we have these bounds, and when the error goes to zero, we have this asymptotic, this leading order term that we have here. All right. So this was the first question. Now the second was, um, can you please forward the example of programming some unitary matrix? Uh, uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Would you like to see again uh, an example? Uh, I also don't understand what does. Mean forward example. Uh, it almost looks as if uh, it. Uh, it Hilal, like... are you there? Uh, please uh, unmute yourself and ask the question if you're there. Hilal. But in the meantime, let me pretend that the question was can you show an example? So, one example was this. The first example I showed was this one. So, you generate, you take your unitary W to be the result of a Heisenberg interaction. So, this is the Hamiltonian. You let uh, the, the, the two systems interact with this Hamiltonian for the right amount of time. Now, if you want to see what is the right amount of time, do have a look in this paper. Now, I don't remember on top of my head, but you would let interact this for the right amount of time uh, with this Hamiltonian. And you put initially the control uh, system with the spin in the spin coherent state. So the spin should be aligned in the direction of the axis uh, that you want to rotate about. And if you do that, um, this is an, an example of quantum programming. This is, um, uh, so this is an example that achieves this, er this scaling of the error. So the epsilon here would be one minus uh, a constant times the dimension of the target square, uh, sorry, a, a spin of the target square divided by the spin of the control. Uh, if you look at this error, you look at how this error epsilon scales or like how the dimension of the control system of the control spin so this 2j control plus one scales with this epsilon you will find that this scales exactly like logarithm of one over epsilon which fits our conjecture because in this case there are two parameters you want to tell to program the, the axis so the axis can be uh, well, there are, you need the two angles to, the, the, to describe a direction. So there are two parameters. So if you go back to our 
conjecture in the end. Oh, oh uh, let me. Yep. So then F would be two. Uh, so two divided by two is one. So logarithm of one over epsilon is the, is the best scaling that we expect for programming uh, with the two parameters. And this is exactly what the scheme I showed to you would achieve. So that's an example. Um, and another example was the one of the phase. Uh, sorry. The one of the phase was this one. I mean, I didn't really describe how you do it, but the idea was um, uh, if you know what phase how phase estimation works, you take n copies of the unitary gate U tensor theta, you apply to a suitable entangled state. Maybe you could use noon states even for this. That's not what we used, but maybe you can also use noon states, the famous states that are used for phase estimation. This would be your program. And then the way to extract the program is to do metrology, to estimate the, the, the angle theta, the phase theta, and then to perform a gate based on the estimate. Uh, all right. Um, which other question, what are that? If we have a reversible gate matrix, is it necessary that this matrix is unitary? Yes, it is. Uh, well, it depends on what you mean by reversible. If by reversible, you mean invertible. So if you mean a matrix V that has an inverse, then it doesn't have to be unitary. It's enough to have an isometry. So it's enough to have V dagger V equal to the identity. But if you want it to be reversible, so not only to be invertible, that after you apply this gate, you can invert it, but you want this gate also to be the inverse of some other gate. So you want, um, you, you want uh, an inverse on the left and on the right, then yes, then you need your gate to be unitary. If you want it to be reversible in the sense that uh, has an inverse on the left and on the right, then it has to be unitary in quantum mechanics, of course. I mean, it's not, it's not that unitary matrices are the only invertible matrices, but they are, they are the only invertible matrices that preserve the length of vectors. So in in the case of quantum mechanics and quantum processes, these are the only reversible gates. Uh, the last question is how to calculate these error terms. Uh, <laughs> that's, of course, uh, the part that I swept under the carpet. I mean, the calculation of these error terms is not easy. Of course, this is, uh, this is what made these results challenging. Um, what can I say? Well, I can tell you how to quantify the error terms. Um, the right way, uh, I mean, one, the simplest way to quantify errors for unitary gates is to consider the gate fidelity. No? If you want a unitary gate U, but instead what you get is, uh, is, uh, is another gate, let's say U prime. So what is the fidelity between U and U prime? So you take the trace of U dagger times U prime, it multiply the two matrices, take the trace, modulus of square, and divide it by the, the, by the dimension, uh, by the dimension, yeah, by the dimension square, sorry. By the, so this will give you a gate fidelity. So this becomes a way to quantify how close is a gate to another gate. And well, if you read in our paper, we show that uh, some other measure of distance of error are related to the gate fidelity uh, in a nice way. And so we were, we, it was easy, well, it was not easy, but it was easier for us at least to compute these error terms in terms of the gate fidelity. And we connected the gate fidelity to the estimation error for gate estimation. So putting everything together, we could, could get those bounds. There, there was a lot, lot of work done uh, done there, mostly by Ishan Yang, actually, no, not really by myself. Ishan is the person who did most of the, the actual calculation. Um, and um, and uh, yes, all this work uh, uh, eventually gives the bounds. But uh, of course, there is a lot of work that goes in the way. And here I just uh, gave you the easy bits and the interesting parts. Um, all right. Um, it seems I answered all the questions. There are no more questions in the chat box. But uh, participants can unmute themselves and ask questions if there are uh, if there are any questions. 
Uh, so please go ahead and unmute yourself and ask questions if you have. Prashanji, do you have questions? No, no, no. I just wanted to thank you. Yeah, thank just you, uh, one you, question you. I wanted to have. My pleasure. Uh, Julio, My pleasure just one you. question I wanted to have. You told that uh, all these uh, quantum computers, they are being programmed using classical approach. That's yes. what you told, the instructions you prepare and give. And why, what is stopping uh, quantum computers to use quantum approach for um, programming? So. Well, to be honest, uh, first of all, I, I don't expect that these results will be really used to do quantum programming anytime soon. So the reason why we studied this is that this quantum programming gives us an upper bound or, or a lower bound, depends on how you call it. it. It tells you what is the ultimate limit that even the classical programming cannot, cannot overcome. So people now have different ways to compile uh, multi-qubit gates into elementary gates. That's what they, how they really do programming on a quantum computer. Now, a question is, how do you know if, how well if you can improve the compiling even more than this. I mean, one can say, ah, now I found a better compiler that gives you less elementary gates uh, for the same gate that you want. So we can improve the way that we, we compile this desired gate on a quantum computer. And then a smarter person will come and maybe find a better way to, to decompose it. So how do you know, like, when you reached the best possible level of uh, right. the best right. compiler. And uh, our work gives an answer to that because you say you cannot go beyond this quantum limit because quant <laughs> classical programming is a special case of quantum programming. So this is kind of, how can I say, is the law of the universe below, below which you cannot go. You cannot find a better quantum software engineer that will find better decompositions into elementary gates mm -hmm. because you cannot, you cannot get an, a better relation between the accuracy and the dimension of the program than this one. And the dimension of the program means really, I mean, the dimension of this, the size of the file, the, the, the number of gates in the elementary gate decomposition in the end. No? If, you, if you have to specify like N gates in N positions, this basically is like, there is a number of bits and this number of bits cannot be less than the number of qubits that we have in the quantum programming approach. That was one motivation for studying this. Then there are other motivations that are more like quantum motivations. For example, if you do want to do quantum error correction without a shared reference frame, this is something that was studied by Preskill and other recent, recently. So imagine that you want to have an error correcting code that is, people call it transversal, that commutes with a bunch of local unitary gates. This is equivalent to doing quantum error correction without reference frames, and basically is a noisy version of quantum programming. So indeed, uh, actually I should have cited the work that my co-authors and I have done building on this. One can use these results on programming to get new results on error correction uh, with this transversal gate, uh, so sort of universal error correction scheme. So error correction is another motivation. Others are reference frames and thermodynamics, because of course, imagine you want to, to have a clock that tells to a, a quantum engine, to a thermodynamic engine, when to change the Hamiltonian in a certain way so that you achieve a certain cycle with your Hamiltonian. If you want the clock to be a quantum system, you have to program the unitary evolution that comes from the Hamiltonian with the state of a quantum system that is the clock. And again, then is a question of what is the best, what is the big, the smallest clock you need for a certain level of accuracy. So that's not really programming. The applications are not directly programming quantum computer. We, we don't directly expect people to do quantum programming of quantum computers, but this is somehow is a, is a primitive result that can be used, can be, Plug them <laughs> is a kind of plug and play result that you can use in different areas of quantum information and it allows us to say things about different areas, uh, different problems in quantum information theory. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Giulio. Thank you. Very, very nice. For the, the talk. For hosting the talk. It's a great talk. Uh, I think uh, people enjoyed the talk. Yeah. Thanks, thanks a lot for coming and giving the talk.
Thank you. Thank you again for the invitation. See you. See you. So RPG, thanks a lot again. Good evening and have a good time. Thanks. Yeah. Good evening. Yeah. See you. Yeah. Yeah. We can leave. Yeah. See you. Bye. Bye.